This is the SF Productions Podcast Network. Whose channel is it anyway? From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. You can check out our audio podcast, How I Get My Way Free Comics, on iTunes or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. Now, when you look at the 500 plus channels on your TV, yes. plus internet and streaming, mm-hmm. it's hard to remember a time when we only had a handful of local stations to pick from. Three, maybe yeah. four. If you're lucky, four, yeah. yeah. And back then, it was simple and kind of necessary to know the channel numbers for those local stations. Click, click, <laughs> click, click. Now, this month, this past month, NBC in Boston dropped their existing affiliate which was owned by a third party, and became an O&O, which is, means owned and operated station, Okay. by NBC slash Cable Town slash Seinhardt <laughs> Wig Company. <laughs> However, it's not a single station. They bought three stations, two of which are these digital sub-channels, mm-hmm. which we'll talk about in a minute, in order to get full coverage of the greater Boston area, and renamed them collectively NBC Boston with no channel number. Hmm. Now, if you're a cable or satellite user there, it's no big deal. But if you're a cord cutter like we are, it's going to be a bit of a mess. Because if you go to a friend's house, it's like, oh, it's not the same channel here. It's something else. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that means NBC is on different stations depending on where you are in Greater Boston. Time will tell if this actually works and people continue watching yeah. or or what. But how did we actually get to this point where ch- cable where channels really don't matter, matter that much anymore? If you go all the way back to radio, it was critical for your audience to know where to tune in. Mm-hmm. Especially since it involved moving this tuner up and down the dial. Yep. <laughs> yep. And if they didn't know the channel number or the station number... They might never find your stations, Mm -hmm. at least not very easily. Mm -hmm. TV at least gave you a clue in the form of a picture (laughs) to know you hit a channel, but it was Mm -hmm. still important. Yeah. So after a lot of technical and legal wrangling, TV in the U.S. ended up with channels 2 through 13, Mm -hmm. which were uh, the VHF stations, VHF standing for very high frequency, which were much clearer uh, channels and more desirable, because mainly because they actually had a, a larger bandwidth mm-hmm. of their station. Yeah, and I remember, well, I'll let you talk about well, UHF and then I'll... So channels 14 through 83 were UHF for ultra high frequency, mm-hmm. more static, kind of the low rent district of the spectrum. And I remember on the earliest TVs that I remember, the VHS, it actually had like a click when you switched yes. the channels. right. But the UHF was still sort of like a toony thing, right. like the radio was. There wasn't a specific click yes. for a station. Mm-hmm. Although there were for some TVs. And I remember distinctly burning out one of those tuner things going... Rrrt, rrrt, rrrt. <laughs> uh, so you, you got 2 through 13, you got 14 through 83. What happened to Channel 1? Well, it was the victim of early experimentation and reassigned to public safety and land mobile use in the very early days of television. Is that where you would have been told to tune in case of emergency, do you think? I think at some point that's what they were going to use it for, Mm -hmm. but it just ended up falling off and used for other purposes. Mm -hmm. And then cable TV came along. And at that time, you're not talking about 500 channels. It was just a way for people living in valleys to get local TV. Mm -hmm. Some local entrepreneur would go up to the top of the mountain, hook up an antenna, and run a cable into the valley, (laughs) and then sell TV to people there. Mm -hmm. It was actually known as Community Antenna TV, CATV. The first was reportedly in Mahoney City, Pennsylvania, going all the way back to 1948. Mm -hmm. This is back when virtually no one had TVs, really. It was the first year there was a, a significant amount of TVs in the U.S. So... For the longest time, local stations were generally on the same station as they were on cable as for broadcast, Mm -hmm. at least for the VHF stations. So it was no real change for the viewers. Mm -hmm. Plus, very few people overall had cable TV. So they didn't need it because they could get it over the air. Which, by the way, you still can. Yes. (laughs) By the way, I love there's, there's these ads you see for this amazing device that lets you pull... TV signals from the the air. air. Yeah, it's called an antenna. That's how we used to do it. That's how we still do it. Yeah. (laughs) 
And then the super stations came along in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. Distant stations began selling their signal to cable companies. And this was all made possible with new, cheaper satellite technology. Mm -hmm. So you could actually, you didn't have to be a multinational corporation in order to get uh, a, a transceiver on a satellite, mm -hmm. you know, or rent one, in order to beam your signal. Mm -hmm. So the first one was WTBS, now of course, the Just TBS, TBS, out of Atlanta, which basically made their mark uh, sh uh, showing Atlanta Braves baseball. Okay. Uh, we had WSBK in Boston, WOR, later WWOR in New Jersey, and I always remember watching that because we were we actually had cable fairly early. We had it. Didn't you have one of those 70s. huge satellite dishes? Well, we did. We did later. Oh, okay. But but we had cable like circa 78, 79, mm -hmm. and that was one of the stations on there, you know. Carvel Ice Cream and yeah. beautiful Mount Airy Lodge and you know. <laughs> uh, then you had WPIX out of New York, WGN out of Chicago, KWGN out of Denver, and KTLA in Los Angeles. Not to mention the true the early true cable only networks: mm -hmm. your HBOs, your ESPNs, your MTVs, etc. Which meant that the Channelists started filling up. Right, and so a lower numbered station was always more desirable. Mm -hmm. Cable companies began to bargain with stations for channel rights. <laughs> Say, if you pay us more, we'll give you the station number you want. Mm -hmm. Local stations began to lose their original locations if they didn't play ball. And really, when it first started, local stations didn't have to pay to be on cable. They, right. they, were, they were a must carry. Exactly. But... This was a way that the cable company could get them to pay. They had to carry them, but they didn't have to give them the channel. Yeah, we could give you one way out there, yeah. or you can get something low number that people are going to find you on. And as more and more channels came along, this mushroomed to the point where local stations rarely get a matching state channel on cable. Mm -hmm. And why it's so hard to find them sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, if you look at a, a modern channel guide it's just like duh, duh, page down page down page down page down mm -hmm. page down on and on and on and on and on yeah defined which again was another reason why channels became less and less important because you have a guide now right yeah. this has been further muddied by digital sub channels which was a result of the move from analog to digital tv in the 90s mm -hmm. so the fcc provided sufficient digital bandwidth for stations to either Put out a single super high quality signal or, or <laughs> split it up into a set of channels. Well, guess which one they did. Yeah, most of them had split it up. And the result is this plethora of sub channels like 10.2 or 4.3. If you're a cord cutter and use an antenna, they're actually kind of easy to find. Mm -hmm. Good luck finding them on those 500 cable channels if they carry them at all because they're not required to. Mm -hmm. Most fall into one of three categories. Classic TV and movies, mm -hmm. channels like MeTV, Antenna TV, Cozy, Get TV, Decades, Ion. Mm -hmm. That's just some of them. And then there are foreign language channels that are mostly in the major markets. Mm -hmm. Then finally, home shopping channels. Right. <laughs> so as technology allows us to directly select a show we want to watch, maybe the channel they're on isn't important anymore. I mean, I mean like... Probably 80% of the shows I watch, I watch either streaming or things that you've recorded for me. Right. And I wouldn't be able to tell you what channel they run, much less what network. Right. You go to Hulu and you don't say, I'm going to go to this channel on Fox and yeah. watch New Girl. Mm -hmm. You just say, I'm watching New Girl. Right. And so channels are being disintermediated mm -hmm. <laughs> to the point where we're not going to care about them anymore. And that's why they're trying to figure out what to do in this brave new world. <laughs> which is leading us to things like CBS All Access, right. which is going to be their online channel, right. which they're going to charge for. As well as NBC Boston. Yes. <laughs> that's how we got to this point. <sighs> <Huh>. <laughs> I don't care what they do to TV channels, I'm still going to watch TV. Mm. And in the meantime, while you're not watching TV, you can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife Treat Comics, on iTunes or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. Thanks for watching. <laughs>